while you maintain your own traditions? And in many other ways do you dare to set up your own teachings above the law and the prophets? Jesus then directed his remarks to all present. He said, But hearken to me, all of you. It is not that which enters into the mouth that spiritually defiles the man, but rather that which proceeds out of the mouth and from the heart. But even the apostles failed fully to grasp the meaning of his words, for Simon Peter also asked him, Lest some of your hearers be unnecessarily offended, would you explain to us the meaning of these words? And then said Jesus to Peter, Are you also hard of understanding? Know you not that every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted shall be rooted up? Turn now your attention to those of you who would know the truth. You cannot compel men to love the truth. Many of these teachers are blind guides, and you know that, if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the pit. But hearken while I tell you the truth concerning those things which morally defile and spiritually contaminate men. I declare it is not that which enters the body by the mouth, or gains access to the mind through the eyes and ears, that defiles the man. Man is only defiled by that evil which may originate within the heart, and which finds expression in the words and deeds of such unholy persons. Do you not know it is from the heart that there come forth evil thoughts, wicked projects of murder, theft, and adulteries, together with jealousy, pride, anger, revenge, railings, and false witness? And it is just such things that defile men, and not that they eat bread with ceremonially unclean hands." The Pharisaic commissioners of the Jerusalem Sanhedrin were now almost convinced that Jesus must be apprehended on a charge of blasphemy or on one of flouting the sacred law of the Jews. Wherefore, their efforts to involve him in the discussion of and a possible attack upon some of the traditions of the elders, or so-called oral laws of the nation. No matter how scarce water might be, these traditionally enslaved Jews would never fail to go through with the required ceremonial washing of the hands before every meal. It was their belief that it is better to die than to transgress the commandments of the elders. The spies asked this question because it had been reported that Jesus had said, Salvation is a matter of clean hearts rather than of clean hands. But such beliefs, when they once become a part of one's religion, are hard to get away from. Even many years after this day, the Apostle Peter was still held in the bondage of fear to many of these traditions about things clean and unclean only being finally delivered by experiencing an extraordinary and vivid dream. All of this can the better be understood when it is recalled that these Jews looked upon eating with unwashed hands in the same light as commerce with a harlot, and both were equally punishable by excommunication. Thus did the Master elect to discuss and expose the folly of the whole rabbinic system of rules and regulations which was represented by the oral law, the traditions of the elders, all of which were regarded as more sacred and more binding upon the Jews than even the teachings of the Scriptures. And Jesus spoke out with less reserve because he knew the hour had come when he could do nothing more to prevent an open rupture of relations with these religious leaders. 4. Last Words in the Synagogue In the midst of the discussions of this after-meeting, one of the Pharisees from Jerusalem brought to Jesus a distraught youth who was possessed of an unruly and rebellious spirit. Leading this demented lad up to Jesus, he said, What can you do for such afflictions as this? Can you cast out devils? And when the master looked upon the youth, he was moved with compassion, and, beckoning for the lad to come to him, took him by the hand and said, You know who I am. Come out of him, and I charge one of your loyal fellows to see that you do not return. And immediately the lad was normal and in his right mind. And this is the first case where Jesus really cast an evil spirit out of a human being. All of the previous cases were only supposed possession of the devil, but this was a genuine case of demoniac possession, even such as sometimes occurred in those days and right up to the day of Pentecost, when the Master's Spirit was poured out upon all flesh, making it forever impossible for these few celestial rebels to take such advantage of certain unstable types of human beings. When the people marveled, one of the Pharisees stood up and charged that Jesus could do these things because he was in league with devils, that he admitted in the language which he employed in casting out this devil that they were known to each other, and he went on to state that the religious teachers and leaders at Jerusalem had decided that Jesus did all his so-called miracles by the power of Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. Said the Pharisee, have nothing to do with this man, he is in partnership with Satan. Then said Jesus, 
How can Satan cast out Satan? A kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. If a house be divided against itself, it is soon brought to desolation. Can a city withstand a siege if it is not united? If Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then shall his kingdom stand? But you should know that no one can enter into the house of a strong man and despoil his goods except he first overpower and bind that strong man. And so if I by the power of Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore shall they be your judges. But if I by the Spirit of God cast out devils, then has the kingdom of God truly come upon you. If you were not blinded by prejudice and misled by fear and pride, you would easily perceive that one who is greater than devils stands in your midst. You compel me to declare that he who is not with me is against me, while he who gathers not with me scatters abroad. Let me utter a solemn warning to you who would presume with your eyes open and with premeditated malice knowingly to ascribe the works of God to the doings of devils. Verily, verily, I say to you, all your sins shall be forgiven, even all of your blasphemies, but whosoever shall blaspheme against God with deliberation and wicked intention shall never obtain forgiveness, since such persistent workers of iniquity will never seek nor receive forgiveness. They are guilty of the sin of eternally rejecting divine forgiveness. Many of you have this day come to the parting of the ways. You have come to a beginning of the making of the inevitable choice between the will of the Father and the self-chosen ways of darkness. And as you now choose, so shall you eventually be. You must either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else will the tree become corrupt and its fruit corrupt. I declare that in my Father's eternal kingdom the tree is known by its fruits. But some of you who are as vipers, how can you, having already chosen evil, bring forth good fruits? After all, out of the abundance of the evil in your hearts, your mouths speak. Then stood up another Pharisee who said, Teacher, we would have you give us a predetermined sign which we will agree upon as establishing your authority and right to teach. Will you agree to such an arrangement? And when Jesus heard this, he said, This faithless and sign-seeking generation seeks a token, but no sign shall be given you other than that which you already have, and that which you shall see when the Son of Man departs from among you. And when he had finished speaking, his apostles surrounded him and led him from the synagogue. In silence they journeyed home with him to Bethsaida. They were all amazed and somewhat terror-stricken by the sudden change in the master's teaching tactics. They were wholly unaccustomed to seeing him perform in such a militant manner. 5. The Saturday Evening Time and again had Jesus dashed to pieces the hopes of his apostles. Repeatedly had he crushed their fondest expectations. But no time of disappointment or season of sorrow had ever equaled that which now overtook them. And, too, there was now admixed with their depression a real fear for their safety. They were all surprisingly startled by the suddenness and completeness of the desertion of the populace. They were also somewhat frightened and disconcerted by the unexpected boldness and assertive determination exhibited by the Pharisees who had come down from Jerusalem. But most of all they were bewildered by Jesus' sudden change of tactics. Under ordinary circumstances they would have welcomed the appearance of this more militant attitude, but coming as it did, along with so much that was unexpected, it startled them. And now, on top of all these worries, when they reached home, Jesus refused to eat. For hours he isolated himself in one of the upper rooms. It was almost midnight when Joab, the leader of the evangelists, returned and reported that about one-third of his associates had deserted the cause. All through the evening loyal disciples had come and gone, reporting that the revulsion of feeling toward the Master was general in Capernaum. The leaders from Jerusalem were not slow to feed this feeling of disaffection, and in every way possible to seek to promote the movement away from Jesus and his teachings. During these trying hours, the twelve women were in session over at Peter's house. They were tremendously upset, but none of them deserted. It was a little after midnight when Jesus came down from the upper chamber and stood among the twelve and their associates, numbering about thirty in all. He said, I recognize that this sifting of the kingdom distresses you, but it is unavoidable. Still, after all the training you have had, was there any good reason why you should stumble at my words? Why is it that you are filled with fear and consternation when you see the kingdom being divested of